Right. So, hey, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today for our latest session of Talks at FTI. We are extremely pleased and honored to have among us Mr. Chris Johansson, who has taken out time from his busy schedule to join us all the way from the States to deliver a talk on how to build a career in data science. So Chris and I sort of go back a long way. Um, we have been working, um, so during my time in New York, we've been working as colleagues. We have uh, delivered on uh, several uh, data science projects for big uh, financial services names. And today Chris is with us to share some of his insights and some of his uh, experiences on exactly what does an aspiring data scientist need to do in order to successfully launch his or her career in the field. So before we move on any further, I just would like to say that um, Chris will be speaking uh, for about 30 minutes, after which we'll have a Q&A session. And uh, the Q&A session will be live, but during the process of the registration, we received a bunch of questions from you guys. So I will be you know, asking those questions with Chris and then you guys can also chime in and ask your questions from him. So without any further ado, over to you, Chris. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the intro, uh, Conan. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, share some of my career story and things I've learned as I've tried to build my own career and things I keep in mind, uh, not only as advice for others, but advice for myself. So we'll put it that way. Uh, I'm currently a digital transformation strategist with a boutique analytics consultancy that's now uh, unfurling some work in the digital transformation and AI space, a company called Access Group based in the United States and New Jersey with offices in Atlanta and a small group around Dallas, Texas, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we number about 180. And as part of my work there, I'm also involved with helping launch a software product that the uh, company has come up with around the idea of analytics enablement and helping companies really drive the adoption of, of analytics around, the, uh, around their organization. So that's my full-time job. And uh, thanks to, or because of, uh, being uh, largely work from home and not traveling so much these days. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, put into motion a longtime dream of mine to start a journal on topics around AI and automation. And it's the uh, name of the journal is the Journal of AI Robotics and Workplace Automation. And I, with that, I'm working with a company based out of London, UK called Henry Stewart Publications. Uh, these journals are practitioner-oriented journals, which means not only can academics uh, write for them, but people such as you can write a journal article potentially one day. Uh, practitioners who uh, work for businesses and government, uh, as well as in academia and nonprofits. So it's a the idea is to really share knowledge on these topics uh, across all the different boundaries, unlike a traditional journal where things might be locked down to just the academics only with a certain type of uh, professional credential. So our agenda for today. Uh, this is, uh, we'll go through some, uh, I've got some slides around a few topics. Uh, starting off this idea of walking backwards, uh, a concept that I borrowed from Amazon about ways to Think of yourself in the future and the, the things that motivate you to have a career in data science in the first place. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about skills as well as what I like to call presence, uh, your own self-awareness of how you present yourself in the world, but how others see you and uh, a little bit about maybe your personal network and, and what really gets you excited to do data science work in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> In addition to my own story, uh, I, uh, another colleague of uh, Conan and mine, uh, who is still based in the, uh, the firm that we used to work at, Sia Partners, 
Uh, I got some tips from him. He's got a similar story I understand from uh, from Kanane ahead of time that some of you uh, aspiring data scientists look to uh, opportunities to maybe go work in other countries. U.S. Uh, is one of them. And uh, I'll be sharing a little bit of, uh, of his story with you as well. And then we'll wrap things up and we'll get into the Q&A. The photo you see here is me back in 1993. Uh, I had the honor of working for then uh, President Clinton's task force in healthcare reform. Uh, and the uh, kind of the amusing analytics related story there is that back at that time, the uh, many portions of the US government were still getting immersed in what was then cutting edge technology such as Microsoft Windows, and Microsoft Excel, and I had those skills. And very quickly, I became responsible for gathering uh, a wide variety of inputs from American taxpayers and, and tabulating all these uh, suggestions into spreadsheets. And then I would take the reports up uh, to uh, other parts of the US government, uh, such as the US Capitol, which unfortunately you saw in the news uh, back in January. Uh, and not so good of a light, but I would actually go back and forth there or over to the White House and meet with senators or Congress people and people on the task force for healthcare reform and share some of these results with them. I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, if you've had a chance to check out my LinkedIn profile, if not, I have a link to it uh, at the end of these slides. Uh, I'll be sharing a PDF of this afterwards. I have a background, uh, underground background in philosophy with a major focus on uh, logic and what's now called cognitive science or uh, neuroscience. And then from there, I uh, self-taught quite a bit. I've always been passionate about learning things, learning Excel, learning about databases, learning about digital technologies, uh, self-taught with data science, took some courseware. And as my career evolved, I made some time, which was a bit of a challenge. I do have a family with children and went back to school and got my master's in business from Penn State. So you will see PhD on, uh, on my LinkedIn. I got close, uh, but didn't, uh, didn't complete the PhD. Uh, I often joke with my family, if I ever came into a large sum of money, I would probably go back to school and try to actually finish my PhD. I feel like it's something I just never got to do. So that's the uh, quick uh, about me. So I'm gonna move to our next slide here. <clears throat> As I said, I'd like to start with everybody today to uh, this idea about walking backwards. Uh, uh, this is an idea that uh, Amazon is a bit famous for, for products but I use it uh, a little bit with myself. And when I give uh, advice to others, uh, I, I ask them, what, how do you see yourself in the future? Just say five years out. It's really hard to predict what's gonna go or even try to plan three or five years in the, in the, in the future. Uh, I will admit my own career is a little bit unplanned. Uh, I had initially planned to go into academia with my PhD and teach at a small college. That was my aspiration. And uh, I've had quite a different career journey since then, although I have had a few chances to teach at a few universities part-time here and there, and still work with some uh, university research centers now. So at least I still have the outlet, but uh, plans and reality sometimes do not match up. But if you can put a plan out there, uh, I like this idea of thinking uh, about a little press release. It could be you speaking at an event, or it could be something maybe not so uh, not so grand, uh, just uh, what's about you on your LinkedIn. This sort of like a press release for yourself. And you imagine yourself a little bit in the future what you might like to be doing. Uh, could be starting as an early stage data scientist and then uh, seeing yourself as a decision scientist, as some of the uh, people at Google have started to uh, redefine the role of a data science uh, oriented towards a certain area uh, of automating decision making. And then if you think of yourself but trying to attain that goal, what would you put in that little story or that press release uh, about yourself? Uh, 
about things you've achieved, schools you've gone to, your certifications that you may have passed uh, as part of your education. And then finally, of course, what do you need to do in order to make that come true? So when I do this, uh, and again, when I either do this for myself and I do this uh, with, uh, with others as well, I kind of try to put this into three segments or buckets. Uh, sometimes we like to say in, in the analytics space, your career choices, uh, different types of jobs uh, you might want to get into, sectors, specialty areas, what type of work uh, and life you would like to have related to your career. Uh, some people like to be working all the time. Some people like to put in their seven or eight hours a day or 10 hour day, uh, depending on your part of the world and go home. And then how do these align with long-term goals uh, that you might have? So <clears throat> going a little bit deeper into this topic here, I'll start with what type of career choice you might aspire to. There are different types of places you can work. Uh, you can work in the for-profit side, like uh, Mr. Aziz uh, has done. You can work in a nonprofit side, like uh, Mrs. Saeed has done. Uh, you might aspire to work in government, or you might aspire, as I did once upon a time, and still do a little bit part-time work in education. Uh, like I said, I still have those outlets uh, working with the journal and a few research centers, but I'm definitely found myself to be very excited about the for-profit world where I could really take my ideas or work with people and see what they really work like in a live setting. Uh, so. <clears throat> Going a little bit deeper into these different sectors, there's of course specialties or uh, vertical areas, uh, high technology, uh, apparel and manufacturing, uh, steel, chemical industry. I know these are industries that are uh, fairly dominant in Pakistan, or there's other parts of the world where there are other industries that you might get into like financial services, uh, or the uh, consulting space, which is its own industry vertical. Within those areas, <clears throat> what are topics that you find to be of interest? Some people like doing work with marketing because marketing is ever changing and there's a lot of data. Some people like the challenges and the risk and reward of working in finance. Uh, <clears throat> helping to, uh, pardon me, you can drink a water here. Uh, helping uh, you know, create new wealth or understand the risk for others to uh, create wealth. Some people like working in supply chain. Uh, other people like working in human resources or manufacturing or uh, technology. Uh, sometimes you can work across different areas. Another thing to uh, consider as part of your career choice is whether you uh, see yourself working and providing services uh, or creating or helping others create products. In the early part of my career, uh, I worked at a product company called General Electric for about nine and a half years. Uh, and then I shifted over to another part of General Electric making products, uh, helping to make products, which was NBC Universal, uh, with all the TV channels around the world and the theme parks and the different networks that NBC Universal owns. Or you could be involved with working uh, with providing services. <clears throat> so I got my first exposure to working with services with eBay Enterprise, where we were largely focused on a product, a hosted e-commerce uh, web store for famous brands around the world, uh, over a hundred different e-commerce clients that I would interact with as part of that work, uh, companies such as Ralph Lauren, uh, <clears throat> major sporting goods companies, tourist companies, uh, coffee companies, uh, just a wide variety of products. But, uh, eBay Enterprise did have its own in-house marketing agency. And eventually, uh, I worked with those uh, that team, part of my job. And then a little bit later in my career, I ended up working at a marketing agency. And then I was back and forth between marketing agency and a few different financial services companies. And then I ended up in a consulting space where I worked at McKinsey for a while, 
Uh, and then I moved from McKinsey over to Sia Partners, where I met uh, and had a chance to work with Koning. Now I'm back at a company where uh, we're very oriented on providing services, but we also resell products and we're starting to make our own products. So these things might change over the course of your career. What sort of lifestyle and work-life balance do you aspire to? Some people like the idea of a lot of travel. <clears throat> Some people like a little bit of travel. Some people don't like to travel at all. If you're in a consulting space, uh, the image on the, uh, the right here is from a, kind of an amusing Instagram and Twitter account called Crazy Management Consultants. Uh, working in the management consulting space as Conan and I did, and, and as I did right before uh, working with Conan at McKinsey, it sounds very glamorous. Uh, you know, these companies have big reputations. They're generating a lot of interest in their work and ideas around the world, but it can be a lot of travel. When I worked for McKinsey, there were times where I wasn't home for weeks at a time, and I would come home and just long enough to basically change clothes, say hi to everybody, and go on a plane and go somewhere else. Created a lot of wear and tear on my family. So I moved to another consulting company, Sia Partners, which had a some light travel, uh, but more of a regional model, uh, where we, if you were based in a New York office, as Conan and I did, you worked with companies pretty much uh, around the uh, New York City, uh, New Jersey area. In my role with Sia Partners, I ended up traveling around a little bit as I helped them create the data science practice in the United States as well as their digital practice. Uh, some people like to have a job where they're able to have a home and have a very stable location. Some people like to move around a lot. Uh, <clears throat> in a management consulting space, uh, for example, you often have opportunities to I uh, go live in another country for a year and work at a different part of the consulting company. Some people like that, some people don't. There's also the idea of the time of day. Some people like a normal work day. Uh, you might be more of a morning person. Uh, personally, it's always been a little bit of a challenge for me to get going in the morning, but once I get going, I have a trouble, or maybe it's a gift, I don't know of uh, shutting down at night, I tend to be, quote, like a night owl, as some people say. <clears throat> as I mentioned, the number of hours you might work per day is another consideration. Uh, some uh, people like a normal work day. Some people uh, don't mind roles where they might have to work a lot of hours, given uh, their long-term goals they're, uh, that they're targeting. Or if you're someone like me, uh, sometimes I put in my, uh, I will take roles for different companies because they don't enable me to do other things. So uh, Access Group is very big on work-life balance where I'm at now. I typically work maybe 40, maybe 50 hours a week at the most. Pretty rare I go beyond that. Uh, I don't really have much travel there. <clears throat> very regionally focused and that's enabled me to do this other thing that I wanted to do, such as starting the journal. And finally, the thing to think about too, as you're looking at your work lifestyle and different places to work, is the type of workplace it is, or what I call the workplace structure. Uh, companies that are making products uh, typically uh, are what some of us in consulting call client side. Uh, so, so if you're working for a construction company or an apparel company, uh, these they tend to have a more predictable uh, work rhythm about them. Whereas with consulting or marketing agencies, sometimes as you're doing your work during the day, you have to make time and uh, put in some work in the evening to try to pursue clients so that when your projects uh, start to uh, come near the end, you have, you have uh, another project lined up. Uh, you know, that's the, uh, if you've ever uh, had a day where you feel like you can't sit down to eat because you're, you're, you're eating, but you're already looking to figure out where your next meal is coming from, uh, consulting or, or the agency space can be like that. And it can be a little bit stressful for people. And then there's this notion of the, the startup life where people, you might have a vision for a product or a service 
uh, you want to start your own company. Uh, with startup life, the roles and the boundaries can be a bit blurry. In my present role in some of the startup work I do at, at Access Group, I end up wearing a lot of different hats sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'm doing some work on the product and trying to help uh, work with the product owners and product managers to come up with a vision for the product. Sometimes I'm working with the salespeople to figure out the materials to go sell the product. Sometimes I'm trying to help the marketing people. Sometimes I am the marketing person. Uh, sometimes I'm recruiting and hiring, as I am now. So uh, <clears throat> startup life can be a little bit more chaotic than these other types of roles, which can be a little bit more predictable. Last but not least, but maybe the most important thing to think about as you think about your career as you're getting going in data science and just in your career in general, is what are the long-term goals you seek to achieve? Some types of careers and lifestyles are fine if you're single, but they're not really great if you have a family. As I mentioned with my time with McKinsey, I started traveling all over the world. Uh, I really bought in, as many people have done, to the mystique of management consulting and heavy travel, but it became wear and tear on my family. I missed my family, they missed me. Uh, I sometimes wasn't the best to be around because I would be very tired when I was at home. And uh, so I had to make a change for the uh, sake of my family. I, I don't regret it. Very, I love my family. And uh, with my new role that I have with Access Group, I get to spend a lot of time with my family these days. I really enjoy that. Uh, <clears throat> what are outside work activities you might uh, like to do in life that you find is fun? What are your passions? Maybe they're uh, attending cricket matches. Uh, maybe you want to uh, play music or write a book or you have a uh, charity or a part-time teaching job that you always like to do that's more of a uh, more of a passion project to get into. Uh, some, some roles are good for that, uh, that are more stable and more predictable. Other roles where you might be traveling uh, quite a bit make that difficult. So, uh, so these are things to keep in mind. Also financial targets that you might be uh, aspiring to. Uh, for everybody who's on the call that's uh, aspiring to be a data scientist, they still see these amazing uh, salary studies out there that it's still a good market. It's a great uh, career path to, uh, to build a skill set in, uh, whether or not you stay a data scientist forever, but to always have that in your quote, your back pocket uh, as a great skill, as part of your other skill sets that you develop over the course of your career. Uh, having strength with the numbers is always a great thing. And then lastly, uh, personal legacy. Uh, what's a long-term impact you might uh, want to leave, uh, not only with your friends and family, but maybe around your community, uh, maybe in your country, maybe around the world, maybe in your industry. Uh, uh, what I've featured here, there's a nice website called 80,000 Hours. The idea here is that in a typical career, people tend to work 40 uh, years. Uh, and over the course of that 40 year career, you might uh, work 80,000 hours. What portion of those hours might you do uh, use to uh, uh, say have an impact, whether again, to your community or on the world at large? So getting there, you. You've thought about where you want to work and what you, where you want to go, what kind of life you want to have, what is the long-term goals that you are aspiring to that motivate you to, uh, to do these other things. And I think uh, I'm assuming maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, it's a common uh, Venn diagram that's out there. I've customized it a little bit for the call today. Uh, and uh, we're kind of skills do you need to get there? Uh, and everybody here is a budding or emerging data science, data scientist. Uh, now there are different uh, commonly known facets of being a data scientist. Some people are very technical and your career path might lead you in a more technical direction. Uh, I know there's a bit of a demand these days for data engineers who manage all the data and bring it all together and understand where the data comes from and can be that expert to support the data scientists 
and also be that expert when people try to take some of that data and do something with it beyond reporting and analysis. Uh, more and more companies are being driven or inspired to uh, leverage uh, automation or AI as levers or uh, tools in helping the company get to their goals. And a data engineer plays a very uh, strong role in that. Uh, or maybe you might see yourself more attuned to math and statistics. And a lot of people orient themselves more towards uh, being a data analyst or creating data visualizations, uh, working with uh, whether it's traditional business intelligence or uh, analytics and reporting tools or doing custom data visualizations with data science uh, software such as uh, Python and R are fairly popular. Or focusing a bit more into statistics, which maybe could take you into different roles, say, in an industry such as uh, insurance, for example. So some people are these magical unicorns where they might blend these skills uh, together to achieve some results and, uh, and, and make things happen in a company. Uh, so uh, healthcare is one industry that I've noticed here. Uh, high technology is another, of course, pretty famous out there. Uh, companies, as I mentioned, such as Google, Amazon, uh, and Facebook and others out there in the space, uh, Alibaba, they're always looking for people that can use, uh, have the computer science capability that can do the coding and the cleaning up of the data and apply statistics and make something automatically happen. Uh, so sometimes you have the opportunity to leverage some of those skills working with, uh, so-called traditional software platforms, but many of those platforms are adding features that integrate with data science, or at least you can build the models and the algorithms and, and uh, data science tools such as R and Python, and then translate them over to something, say like a chatbot software that might be used by a lot of companies, or a robotic process automation that might integrate with AI or invoke a, a Python application as part of automating the process. A, a great area to apply your data science skills. Uh, a lot of di data science emerged from the marketing space with that need to tie different types of data together just to tell a basic story from advertising networks and websites and internal analytics tools. Uh, that's still a very strong area to apply data science uh, skills to. But as Conan and I saw, uh, Conan and I saw when we uh, work together uh, in both of our uh, previous uh, in our previous life together in New York. Uh, we had a chance to work with colleagues who would apply data science skills to uh, IT cyber uh, security and writing uh, algorithms that would test different systems with automated scripts to make sure that they were uh, doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, so that companies such as uh, big banks and financial services companies can remain compliant and uh, automatically filter out bad actors who might be trying to uh, apply for loans. Uh, finance underwriting and risk is still a very popular area for applying data science skills. A few roles before my time with uh, both SIA and McKinsey when I worked at what is now One Main Financial, a multi-billion dollar lending company uh, in uh, Delaware in the United States. Uh, we started bringing in data science such as R and Python uh, to complement what was happening with SAS with the idea that using R and Python, we can bring in different types of data uh, to help us uh, find customers who might be underserved with different types of uh, financial service offerings and see uh, maybe we, you can't find so much about that person in a traditional risk analysis, but if we look at some other data, say social media conversations or LinkedIn or elsewhere, uh, you can uh, give that person a favorable score and enable them to uh, take out a loan. So last but not least, as part of uh, developing your skills in computer science and math and, uh, and in a business context, uh, actually applying those things to something like an industry vertical or a functional area, making sure you have the skills so that when you do your analysis and you create your algorithms, 
you can communicate what you've done. Uh, you can clearly share the story of, uh, of an outcome so that you can drive your point across and your outcome uh, is uh, taken into consideration and put into action by senior leaders that you might be working working with. So, and a lot of companies are taking this idea of agile, uh, which you uh, maybe you're getting some exposure to uh, there at the Frontier uh, Technology Institute. But more and more are starting to use this idea of agile that's come from the digital world and the and development world, and think of that in the business world. Uh, Traditionally, a lot of companies, they will put together their project ideas at the beginning of a year, and then they'll pick certain projects that are prioritized and execute on the projects, and then they'll wait and see if those projects work, and then they'll try to get to the rest of the things on their list. And in the past, those projects would just work over a long work stream, and there wouldn't be any real evaluation of the project or the uh, artifacts, uh, the deliverables, uh, towards the end of the project. Whereas in Agile, you break that idea up into uh, into different themes, and then you start to uh, use Agile to uh, uh, define little work units that are often done every two weeks, where uh, you'll have uh, someone help you organize the work, uh, check in with you every day to make sure things are going along, uh, help you test out your work uh, and then at the end of that two week period deliver something rather than waiting for say the end of a four or six month period to deliver something so that's the rough idea of agile in addition to skills you need to think uh, a little bit to of presence and what you might need to do to uh, work on that as part of your skills uh, first and foremost is becoming a bit self-aware uh, i was fortunate enough in my career with a few large companies where they, uh, as part of our, our personal development, they uh, paid for us to take a few tests, such as the Myers-Briggs personality test, uh, or would encourage us to try some other tests. Uh, there are a few other ones. Uh, one is called DISC. And, uh, it's more of a self-learning thing called Strength Finders. It's a book and a website to help you really get an understanding of, okay, what's my personality type as I get in this sort of work? Am I someone that's more introverted and I prefer to work on my own? Maybe that will lead you towards more of a, uh, that tends to lead to people to more technical or mathematical oriented work. People that tend to be a bit more outgoing uh, tend to be these more uh, unicorn types that a lot of companies are still looking for that can do everything and, and talk. Uh, I've been scored more than once as uh, in a Myers-Briggs test. Uh, it's called IN, uh, INTP, it's personality type. Uh, the I stands for introverted, and sometimes these uh, tests can make you think a little bit about your career, and like, what do I need to do to be maybe be less introverted and build up the courage and get the uh, uh, get the ability to uh, to speak to people like I'm speaking to you today. Uh, there was an uh, early part of my career I wanted to I was that person who was more research oriented. And I like to hide in my cubicle or my other working areas and do my research and hand it to somebody. And then I would step back and let them speak on my behalf. And more and more, uh, as I gained some confidence in myself, uh, I became a little bit more outgoing. And now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, maybe a little bit too outgoing at times, uh, admittedly. Uh, so <clears throat> with that self-awareness is uh, being a little bit aware of how others see you out there in the world uh, in the modern era. Uh, you're, you'll be out there and known to people based on your, uh, usually on your LinkedIn page or elsewhere as data scientists. Uh, it's been a recent uh, phenomenon where more and more, in addition to a LinkedIn, people will have a link to their GitHub where they might have sample projects that they've done uh, to as kind of a portfolio, uh, a little bit like how someone who's in a creative uh, space uh, like in you know someone who's an artist uh, usually has a portfolio of drawings or photos uh, people like to see a little bit do you not only uh, look at what you say about yourself and the education you achieve and maybe the technology certification test you may have passed in addition to your uh, frontier technology institute certification 
but looking a little bit to see have you done a little bit to kind of showcase your work out there on GitHub or share your knowledge a little bit, say in a blog or maybe just uh, at least on LinkedIn, just liking an article or sharing it to your profile. Uh, some people don't really care too much about that perception. They're very, very, very introverted. They're very focused on your uh, just doing their work. They're, uh, you know, uh, usually the type of folks that are drawn into engineering roles uh, in uh, technology and data. Uh, so it's okay. It's just a matter of personality, but it's something you should be a little bit aware of as you look at different career opportunities. Last but not least, uh, to make sure you get there and make sure you have a good network of peers and mentors who help you optimize your presence out there a little bit and stay focused on your long-term goals. So, <clears throat> With all that comes passion. What inspires you to get into data science in the first place? Uh, for me, I was initially inspired because I thought it was interesting and new. Uh, I tend to be that type of personality where there's something new I want to take a look about, look at it. I heard there was a way to make it easier to do uh, tied data together in a marketing context. Uh, and that's what initially drew me into data science. And then I had the opportunity to see how it could be used in other settings such as risk. And then really I uh, got a bit more inspired when I saw that you can do more than analysis, but you can do data science to create prototype applications and uh, do some automation as well. Uh, <clears throat> so do you have that mindset that is intellectually curious? You keep your uh, mind open to things. You follow blogs or email newsletters, but you're a little bit practical. Uh, and you're not wasting your entire day every day just reading things you're actually making things happen or you're scheduling time. Uh, typically with me, I have email rules and I schedule things to go into a folder. Uh, so, and then I find time to talk uh, and read through things. Are you a problem solver? Are you brave enough to try your ideas out solving puzzles, uh, tying to your long-term uh, goals? Do you see yourself doing good um, with your new data science superpowers, and of course, as many of you know, are you patient enough to spend a lot of time cleaning up your data? Uh, try to bring things to a close. Uh, I know I've been talking for a little bit today. Thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, <clears throat> letting me chat here. Uh, I want to share briefly a little story uh, about another former uh, colleague of mine in Conan. Uh, his name is Khalil. Uh, I've had the great opportunity to get to know uh, nice people such as Galileo over the course of my life. People that are brave enough to not only learn new things, but to make that big leap and move to another part of the world and start a career and get going. Uh, some people are not so brave. I'll admit I like to travel, but I've always been pretty much bound to my home area. So it always amazes me when I see people do this. Uh, he landed in the U.S. He uh, came from Morocco, completed undergrad and graduate degrees in data science, and he continues to uh, be involved with uh, hackathons uh, and some career mentoring. And uh, I may have mentioned this uh, when we started uh, our talk today, but I'll share a PDF of this presentation with some links here so that you can go explore things a little bit more afterwards, just for the sake of time. So Khalil shares some different tips, some of these things you might know. Uh, you'll be learning there at the Frontier Institute uh, different skills you should focus on, like statistics, machine learning. Uh, learn to love anything uh, about big data. Get a thorough knowledge of databases and cloud analytics and cloud. Everything is going cloud. Uh, a lot of uh, firms are investing very heavily now in moving their traditional capabilities to cloud. So hopefully you're getting some exposure to some of that uh, the Frontier uh, Technology Institute. Uh, if not, make some time to, uh, to get some cloud skills. Uh, some of these companies offer you some free environments that you can log into and make some projects. Learning to code online, uh, learning to uh, wrangle or clean data, visualize it, do reporting. Again, practice on real projects, uh, find different GitHubs out there where you get sample data. and uh, <clears throat> and then make your own GitHub to show how you took that data and made something out of it. Uh, be willing to look for knowledge anywhere. 
you have to be a little bit creative as a data scientist, as I'm sure you know by now. You have to be resourceful. Uh, Khalil, again, emphasizes the soft skills and how you need to communicate things. Uh, he recommends getting involved with different hackathons. He's been involved with two uh, multiple hackathons. He's uh, won or uh, come in second or third in different uh, hackathons in the Charlotte area. And follow different websites. Katie Nuggets is pretty popular. Data Science 101 is another. I'll make sure as part of sharing this presentation later, I'll add another slide uh, for uh, some websites to go through. So. so to wrap things up, I hope you're excited about your future. I am. Uh, data science is here to stay. It's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, finish school. Uh, take some time when you have a chance to walk backwards. As I mentioned, sharpen your skills, invest in your presence, uh, build your network. Uh, you don't have to be too aggressive about it, but take your time. Uh, I make a big point almost instantly when I meet somebody on my phone or very quickly uh, thereafter in business that I'll send them a LinkedIn connection and stay inspired. So with that, we'll bring the Q&A. So. Um, thank you very much, Chris. I think it was uh, extremely enlightening and uh, informative, um, especially like there are some things that I learned for the first time, um, you know, after I went through your presentation, um, because a lot of times, uh, like from the people that I've spoken with here in Pakistan, is that most of the people I've met, they like were aspiring to be data scientists, they typically try to focus on skills, what they also need to focus on now after your presentation, which I also learned is the presence of mind as well as the passion, which they also probably would, uh, you know, need to focus on while they're developing their skill set. So I think it was uh, extremely informative and uh, we still have uh, 15 more minutes to go. So I guess uh, we can open the floor now for questions. Um, so guys, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, we'll take them one by one. Okay, so we have Abrar here. So Abrar, you can please unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Johannesson. Uh, thank you for uh, a very informative uh, session. Uh, one thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, at FBI, uh, we focus more towards skill-based learning rather than a degree-based learning. So, you know, the examples that you've shared, of course, you've also uh, worked at least towards a PhD and probably would have completed the coursework and there's some formalities that might have been left behind, which you didn't complete. And uh, another example of uh, Khalid, I guess, whom uh, you shared, has also done masters in analytics. So uh, what's your point of view, like where, where the trend is moving towards? Because at, at times we see people who might not have degrees, right? But they have the right skill set to get the job done. How is the industry assessing that, right? Because if you don't have any uh, name to your skill set in terms of a degree or a certification, uh, how do companies or how do industries approach it in assessing talent uh, in this field? Uh, sure. Uh... <clears throat> Some companies I see will actually do a little bit of a skills test. Uh, they might give you an assignment, a simple project to do, to uh, uh, test and see if you know what you've actually put on your LinkedIn and on your resume. Uh, every company these days looks at LinkedIn and does some sort of scan of the internet with your name. So uh, different ways to get your name out there, uh, so to speak. As you build your skills is, uh, as I mentioned a little bit, uh, maybe uh, get a blog going uh, carefully, maybe put a little bit of content out on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn pretty much makes it easy for anybody to write articles these days, or at least uh, share a link from uh, maybe something you see somewhere else, like uh, we mentioned earlier, like Katie Nuggets. Uh, there was an article, you can do something as simple as, I saw this on Katie Nuggets. I thought this was interesting. What do you think? And that didn't take a lot of time. That took me maybe 15 seconds to say. Uh, it'd probably take you 30 seconds to type up and click share. And that uh, 
you will generate a little bit of people will see that you're doing a little bit more uh, than uh, than coursework uh, and uh, and and getting certifications. Now the certifications are are great. Uh, I still see a lot of demand in the space for people who have certifications or who don't have formal data science degrees. Uh, a, a, a sizable number of uh, friends that I have that do work in data science, they don't have a data science degree. They might have a, uh, a, a mathematics degree or some other degree. Uh, I do know some people that don't haven't completed their college degree at all, and they've moved into not only data science, but executive roles uh, just by showing the impact of the work that they get in there and say, I've now built a story where I came in and I did work for this person and or this company, and I helped them save money or I helped them make money. Uh, and I have a little bit of a uh, little bit of story to tell there, and other people will see that you can generate results. You might have have the official college degree, and you're fine. Uh, I'm actually mentoring uh, someone right now who's been out of the workforce, has college degrees, but he hasn't worked in about 20 years uh, due to family reasons. Uh, he's a bit non-traditional. Uh, he's been a stay-at-home father. Uh, and I uh, coached him to go and uh, mentored him a little bit to do some uh, online uh, training courses, uh, such as Data Camp. Uh, and now he's uh, he's going to something like the Frontier Tech Institute that's based in the Philadelphia area of the U.S., where it's a, uh, a coding boot camp. Uh, and he's uh, pretty excited now, and he's he's gotten over some of his fears that oh, I haven't. I haven't done programming in 20 years. I can't pick this stuff up. And I just showed him. It's like, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, when you're learning uh, things, in, especially in the computer, it just throws an error message. It, you know, you're know, you not going to get in trouble. Uh, you're not going to break things. Uh, so, uh, and you, you do little things to help people get over those fears. And uh, But I find it uh, getting involved uh, you know, whether it's sharing or on a blog or uh, doing some networking. Uh, I did a little bit of uh, using the magic of Google, I call it, uh, seeing that there's different meetup groups in Pakistan. Uh, there's different global groups. Uh, I'll have a few links to those when I share this presentation that you can get involved with. Uh, personally, that's how I've built a very good network around the world. Uh, I got involved in the marketing space with a group called the Digital Analytics Association. It's very focused on digital marketing data, data from sources like uh, Adobe Analytics and Google Analytics and similar tools and social media tools. And then through that, I, I gained and got uh, interested in uh, with data science and uh, had the opportunity to then self-learn with online courses and uh, things like that. So. Uh, Again, it all depends on what you aspire to. Obviously, if you want to be a professor at a university, or there's a few mark, you know, companies out there with research centers, say like a Google or Microsoft, maybe a PhD might be important. But with a lot of other companies, uh, you're either bachelors or masters, or simply showing that you've got the passion and the skills and the energy that you can do these, uh, do this kind of work. Um, as long as you have some some certification and certificate as the one that you're achieving from uh, Frontier Tech Institute, that's a that's a good thing rather than just you know people look at least for a certification of some kind. Sure, thank you, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. So, and uh, Great. Um, part of it, so a little thing too, is uh, uh, contributing to the open source community. If you have that skill set, is another way to show expertise. So. Sorry, Connie. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the next question uh, we have is uh, Imam. So Imam, you can uh, raise, uh, you can unmute yourself and please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, such an informative session it was. Actually, my, I was uh, raised my hand uh, at that particular time, sir has cleared my answer, so I down my answer. 
so uh, one thing i want to ask uh, in the starting of the session uh, he has discussed some pub uh, discuss something about uh, publications if mm -hmm. someone want to uh, publish papers or uh, like something so there are so i i want some guideline for for some journals and uh, for uh, for some tools uh, which are used for for public uh, for publications for international oh. data science sure i mean uh, with with publications my own personal tool i just use microsoft word or google docs uh lately using google docs a little bit more uh because i can easily share a link to somebody and get their feedback on my ideas uh when i try to do an outline for uh, some of either the uh, some of the interviews that I'm uh, working on planning to do as part of the journal. Uh, we're uh, looking to have maybe an interview feature with some different thought leaders, what that might, those questions might look like. Uh, or uh, as I'm just, uh, as with any, uh, as with any article, just uh, typically I put together a little outline at least, and then I will, as soon as I can, find at least one or two other people to uh, talk with in uh, in my network, uh, or I'll use it as a way to build my network. Uh, if I'm not connected to an expert on a topic and I want to get to know them, uh, people are usually pretty good and open. Uh, I found in many parts of the world uh, to uh, accepting a LinkedIn invite or maybe an email if they're at a university and say, "I want to like find some time. I read a book of yours or an article." And I have an idea of my own article that uses some of your ideas. Can you spend some time with me or just uh, with my work colleagues? Uh, I'll, I'll just bounce it off them. It all depends on the type of article that you want to write for. Uh, I try to keep in mind the audience that I'm writing for. A uh, little bit of an idea out there of design thinking uh, is another skill set in addition to agile. The uh, design thinking is this idea when you're everything that you do, you're thinking about either a person or a fictional type of person that has a lot of shared attributes that other people have called a persona. And you're, you're writing your articles to that persona. Uh, so whether I'm doing marketing materials uh, and, and other uh, writings for access group uh, that are targeted towards executive personas or the academics. Uh, I try to keep that in mind as well. So, but uh, there are different uh, outlets. Uh, <clears throat> an easy one is to get a blog set up and write some, uh, you can write articles on a blog and kind of build your skill up that way if you've never written an article before. Uh, or like I said, in Google Docs. And then at least you can get some feedback and then you can refine your article and then uh, when you find a, an outlet that you might want to have publish your article, uh, it, it'll be in good enough shape to, uh, to send it to them. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Koso, I think you're next. Hi, Chris. Uh, this is Atahar. Uh, I'm in a station in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. I'm not sure uh, you are open for the network with me, actually. I need a little bit of breakthrough in the US market, even though I'm on a clinical side. So mm -hmm. any input would be the best option. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, sure, happy to. Uh, I'm happy to network with anybody that's on our call today. Uh, I have a pretty, pretty large LinkedIn network and just personal network beyond LinkedIn after 20 plus years. So I always look forward to meeting new people and talking for a little bit. Um, so, Chris, uh, there are a couple of questions that we received as part of the registration process for this uh, for this talk. So, I just think it's adequate to ask for me to ask on behalf of some of the participants who have shared those questions. So, you know, uh, as you may not know, freelancing is a pretty big industry in Pakistan. So um, as per an article in CNBC, Pakistan was ranked fourth in the world for fastest growing earnings for freelancers. So what in your opinion is the scope of working as a data science freelancer? Uh, 
it's certainly it's it is it is say uh, if you have that you've filled your skill set and you've shown your reputation and you can uh, quote hang up your uh, your store sign on the internet somewhere. Uh, freelancing is uh, and again if you have the right uh, setup to do that, uh, whether it's a place in the world you live in uh, or uh, or family backing you, it can be you know, different countries. It can be a little bit more of a challenge. I think in the U.S. it can be uh, a little bit more of a challenge because uh, we have private health care that you usually have to buy your own or uh, get through an employer. Uh, but uh, freelancing is uh, is great. It's a great way to get you to to learn different things, uh, to uh, to work with different industries. Uh, the one of the downsides to freelancing, as I mentioned in one of the slides, when you think about work life. Uh, when you are freelancing, you are like your own personal consultant or marketing agency. So sometimes you're you're eating your meal while you're chasing after your next meal, uh, and uh, so that's something that you have to uh, keep in mind with freelancing. But uh, also one of the nice benefits with freelancing, uh, on the plus side too, is you're learning different things. Uh, it gives you uh, a lot of people I know that are freelance. Uh, or have built their own individual consulting companies and build up from that, uh, it does give you a little bit more free time to get involved like industry groups or journals or, uh, or to build some open source projects if you have a passion to be involved and contribute to the global open source community. So I've worked, with a, I've worked with a freelancer myself when I was at NBC uh a long time ago from pakistan and it was a good experience so i can uh, give a thumbs up to the uh, talent base there working on uh, an application and some analytics uh, i believe it might have been work related to one of the two olympics broadcasts if i remember correctly so. great um lastly one of the more interesting questions uh, that we also got um i believe it was from somebody who's working in the profession. So the question was, um, so if you're already working in the data science profession, how does one excel or stand out? Well, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, uh, different ways to stand out is uh, you stand out with your results. Uh, if you build a good reputation, you'll build, uh, you think about the marketing space a little bit and marketing yourself, uh, word of mouth. Uh, people will talk about you. Hey, do you know uh, uh, Dr. Coso? Uh, I'll just use an example on our call today. Is an expert in this area and does this amazing work and you should get to know, you should get to know this guy and talk with him uh, and uh, maybe he can help you out. And then you're, you're that's one way of, uh, of building uh, another one, depending uh, if you if you work uh, different companies, depending on the size of the company, they might have like a career path uh, that they offer, uh, whether within a company or uh, software within the human resources tools that tell you different things you need to learn and achieve in order to move up. Uh, so to use an example for both of us, uh, Conan. Uh, in a consulting space, uh, you uh, might have a an evaluation every six months or every year, and as part of that, you you get a uh, you get a PowerPoint or something that says this is what's not only expected of your current role, but if you want to move to the next role, these are skills you should have or learn, and you can look at that and use that to add on to your frontier technology uh, institute skills and and move up uh, or develop yourself so to speak, uh, building your network out there, uh, getting your voice out on LinkedIn uh, a little bit helps uh, to be a little bit visible. Again, as I mentioned, it's very simple to do just by liking things that the people that you follow or uh, sharing things and making a simple comment. What do you think about this? Or I found this interesting, here's why. Uh, things like that are different ways that people can move up. It de of course, it depends on the organization. Obviously, in academics, if that is an avenue you want to take, uh, you need to get, uh, typically, you need to get published in a journal and have positive feedback from your students with the annual surveys and other scoring that happens there. No, you're absolutely right. Like, uh, you know, especially in today's world where 
I think every pretty much it's so easy to share your content with the rest of the world. You bring up some point when your work, showing your work with the with the rest of the world, like it's a blue. You just have, you have to be uh, just make sure when you do that work sharing, you get permission. To do it. So. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to get in trouble for sharing a trade secret. So that's why you'll see sometimes some companies like like in a consulting space, they'll be very vague. We worked with a big bank and we helped them improve these capabilities and it's almost like reading an academic paper. Uh, so, I think we lost uh, we lost Conan there. Uh, any other questions? You can, uh, if you're comfortable, you can say them out loud, or you can put them in the uh, chat message too. Some people have different ways of communicating, or if you have some things in your uh, in your head and uh, you don't, you're not quite ready to ask a question, but you want to follow up with me afterwards, uh, uh, Cunning's happy to share with my uh, email address, and I have my LinkedIn mm -hmm. that'll be on, on the slide as well. So, yeah, uh, Chris, I just had a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, which uh, so which platforms uh, do you prefer uh, for like dashboarding and for? Uh, for reporting, I, I saw some profile on your access group. So you, you're using quite a bit Tableau and Power BI. So which like uh, reporting tool would you prefer uh, is, the, is the best in the market? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I can, uh, I'm going to say it depends because we work with a lot of big vendors. Uh, we work with Click, uh, we work with Tableau, uh, we work with uh, Microsoft Power BI uh thought spot uh different vendors have different uh what we call use cases uh you know some people like uh thought spot because they have this idea that you can a uh, little bit of a different idea where it's almost like talking to a chat bot in order to get results is what thought spots kind of driving at uh which for a lot of people could be a more natural way of interacting with data just like we're talking today and you know talking with a either through your keyboard or maybe uh, through a voice application to your tool, uh, ThoughtSpot, a little bit of a pioneer in that space. Uh, seen a lot of interest in the Microsoft Power BI because it's a, a little bit easier to uh, pick up uh, for people who have some Excel skills. The Microsoft has made it very easy to take something that you've created in Excel and replicate it in Power BI. Uh, a lot of clients that we work with use Click. Uh, Click has features in addition to the uh, reporting and what they call Click apps or applications where you have some interactivity features, mm -hmm. but it also has some great capabilities for bringing the data together. Uh, whereas something like Tableau is great for creating dashboards and reports, uh, but they're, uh, you, you have to do use something else usually to bring the data together in Tableau. Software like Alteryx is pretty popular uh, for for that. Uh, so uh, we work with a wide variety of tools from the reporting and dashboard tool down to the uh, down to the cloud layer. So there are uh, different companies like different tools for different reasons and. Uh, some are very driven by the reporting and the visualization. Uh, others are uh, have, see that as a, a great capability, but there's some other features that they also want in their enterprise tool. So, uh, and uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, all of these tools more and more are either connecting with or running on top of the cloud. Uh, that's certainly a skill that you need to uh, pick up. Uh, and. Uh, one thing to think about if you're targeting yourself uh, uh, to a particular employer, sometimes you can, uh, what I like to call reverse engineer, it's kind of like the, or like the walking backwards idea. If you aspire to a job, say with Google, you'll see the different languages that they use and the requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you look up a person who works at Google with that job title already, 
they might be uh, blogging about Python or C, pardon me, or some other uh, things out there uh, that they're uh, working with. So it all depends on the company uh, and the use cases. Sometimes within a company, you'll see multiple tools. Uh, I've seen companies have two or three different business intelligence tools and the marketing people will spend a lot of time in Python and R. So, uh, so it's good to have a little bit of exposure to different things. Uh, so. That's great. Thanks for, the, thanks for the answer. Over to Conan. I'm <laughs> last from the uh, before we wrap any has any final words. Uh, final words here, I would say uh, keep in touch, uh, keep that learner's mindset, stay excited. Uh, data science is a great field to be in. Uh, do your best if you haven't already, get at least a little bit more comfortable with uh, interacting with the internet and, and building your personal network a little bit. Uh, a good portion of your career, you'll hear this as a rule of thumb, for those of you just getting started and some of the, you who know this already, uh, once you're along in your career, uh, sometimes it could be as much as who you know as what you know uh, in order to uh, either do things you want to do or achieve results you want to achieve or, uh, or to make your next move and do something interesting. Uh, I mean, my exposure to Henry Stewart's publications was through people that I got to know through the Wharton School. And there was a previous journal at Henry Stewart called the Journal of Applied Marketing Analytics. And uh, I was very excited to get, get involved with the journal. Uh, and uh, that particular journal about uh, four or five years ago. And then I built up friendships at Henry Stewart Publications and that uh, gave me the uh, motivation and kind of the courage to say, you know what, I have my own journal idea. So, and they, uh, they like the idea. And here we are. First edition should be uh, hopefully coming out in uh, uh, within uh, a few months or so. Like uh, like many things, uh, things got slowed up a little bit by the uh, by the the virus. It's impacting different parts of the world, uh, especially the United Kingdom, as you may have seen in the news. So. And also, Chris, uh, like so, I think this is an excellent opportunity for you to also probably um, you know share that. Um, like aspiring writers or people who are interested in sharing, uh, you know, their uh, written work that they have done in this space um, for this journal because they can get published on that. So mm -hmm. I think somebody did mention in this conversation earlier where they're interested in, uh, you know, sharing the publications. I, I think um, your platform is uh, really ideal for that the AI robotics and automation journal platform mm -hmm. is really ideal for that. Yeah, it, it, all, it all depends on the article. If it's not a mm -hmm. good fit for this particular journal, uh, I know the space well enough now where I can uh, you know, share some other outlets or ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And if people have ideas uh, to go beyond the journal to a book to, uh, you know, I, I've been engaged enough now with some of these publishing companies. Uh, I will admit I've been working on my own book idea, but it seems to be taking much longer than I ever figured it would. So when you you think about work-life uh, balance and your long-term goals, you know, that's one of mine. I want to eventually get at least one book uh, published as part of my career, if not two. I've at least helped uh, some people uh, write some books, uh, either contributing feedback. Uh, you'll see that in my LinkedIn. I had the incredible honor of working with uh, Tom Davenport, who's probably one of the most famous uh, uh, thought leaders in the analytics and knowledge management and automation space, and uh, had a nice uh, conversation with him one day, and that led to uh, uh, getting listed in, in the acknowledgments of one of his books called Only Humans Need Apply. Uh, I had a chance to work with one of my Penn State professors on a few books on this idea of creativity in business. And uh, so at least I have my name and some acknowledgments of some books, but I don't have my own book out there yet. But I do have an outline. 
I've talked to some publishers, but uh, like the journal, it seems like it's taken years for me to get this off the ground. <laughs> so. All right, um, I think uh, with this, we can uh, wrap up this session. So thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time out, especially on a Sunday, especially um, when it's, you know, your morning. And thank you everyone for, uh, you know, for listening in, for joining us for this session. The recording will be shared um, with all the participants. And as soon as Chris shares me uh, with me his presentation, I will also, we will also share it with you guys. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, please stay in touch. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. It's nice to meet everybody. Bye. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.